is called spada da terreno. Um, that's, that's a, for example, uh, the Greco family in Rome um, has several you know, well-known famous duelists and they still have their historical fencing hall in Rome that is now considered a heritage of a UNESCO. It's beautiful. They still have all these originals on the wall and, um, and they, they teach modern fencing. But it, interesting enough, you know, before these things became popular again, they were teaching a traditional fencing, but more for staging, for to actors, right? For people who need to learn to do stage combat. And, um, but they were actually teaching the original, you know, what they learned in their family and passed along. Uh, but nobody was, was dueling anymore at the time. And now, almost nobody. There are rumors that some people still do, uh, but it's not the mainstream. So I would say these are different areas. So they are still preserved. I mean, I, I study with people who uh, teach modern pugilism and boxing, but they learn uh, Italian boxing, traditional forms of boxing, then go also in bare knuckle. Um, and they are tightly connected to going from distance to close range and transition to wrestling, open hand, um, what we will call dirty tricks for them is more uh, the street boxing, how that would, which when you go into studying sources, there are you know, many documents like in 1800, um, for example, uh, there a work published by Carmina in the 1869 called Box for Self-Defense. Um, with box was written B-O-X, because at that time there was not even uh, like a box. <laughs> uh, but um, that's how they were, you know, uh, their interpretation, I guess. Um, but is a, um, so is a pugilism uh, that use kicks, use wrestling, use, um, and use a, a interesting fencing terminology. Like they think of, you know, using your hands like if they were weapons and with the same fencing idea, the line intercepting, timing, measure, the footwork, the angles, um, as if you're like using weapons, but you have your hands as that, like almost a, uh, a free hand or hand fencing, kind of like that. And when you study with those people now and they say, okay, yeah, well, that's what I learned from my coach, who learned from his, that's what we, we teach to kids, they come here, we want to put them on the ring to go, um, you know, make maybe a profession out of boxing, but then we also teach our traditional way, you know, and what do you do without gloves? It's a different way. You can't punch the way you do on the ring. You're going to break your hand against the skull, you know. <laughs> there are whole different rules. You can't think that, you know, there are other people will come. Take, someone takes a chair and you're done from behind. So there is a different mindset, and it's beautiful that some of those things are still taught. So that's in my exploration, and uh, there are forms of wrestling in different regions, and many of those things are still alive and preserved. Some are more a few people, some are like really established traditions and families and uh, cultures around well established. Um, some are easy to have access to, some are really hard because they're still protected and only taught within the family or to trusted people for historical reasons. And, uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that if, if you want to give a couple of examples, which I think are beautiful. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. So for example, let's talk about you know, the arts of knives in South of Italy. Um, and I would say, grossly speaking, uh, we could divide them in two areas, right? One are dueling arts, people and, and arts based on studying knife for self, not for self-defense, but for dueling in the context of challenging another person, maybe fighting for honor. And the honor might be not necessarily yours, could be your family, could be your town. So it's, um, it's a form of you know, self-defense, but almost culturally, you know, there are rules in terms of you know, not being able to defend your position or your word could compromise entirely the, uh, how a certain family will be then um, accepted or the consequence on that uh, group of people that you represent during the duel. So there are lots of implications around. And so dueling fencing is one big area and the other is more um, 
a self-defense kind of use of knives. So I'll give you two examples. Um, and actually, if people want to learn more, um, so I'm, I've been you know, working in studies and doing research of that. Um, and so I'm uh, produce a documentary and there is a research work that people can find on the, you know, italianmartialarts.org. So it's www, one word, italianmartialarts.org. And uh, currently the work is focused on one region, which is Apulia. The idea we will expand this over, over time. Uh, we recently released actually uh, one of the different schools that are present in Apulia, one full archives of one of those arts. And I'll tell you a bit more. But you know, even just Apulia is incredible how rich of different schools and traditions are, completely different from each other. Right, and so let's say I'll give you one example on um, the school of dueling in terms of dueling school. And those are, you know, kind of spread, not just in Apulia, but in, in different regions um, in, south, in the south, Calabria, Sicily. They have very strong traditions of those like dueling, uh, fencing, dueling arts. Fencing and stick with stick fightings as well, but typically that comes more with, with knives. And knives, sometimes, again, there are all different forms, but some could be almost small swords. They're very long, like stiletti with incredibly long uh, blades. Some could be short and more like for carrying. But as I said, sometimes there was time to prepare. There was a challenge and people were coming and was an event where there were witnesses and people were there. And so it was not really fighting for yourself. And so in that sense, du duel, the duel though, which means the battle of two, uh, in reality was a battle of two representing communities, which, you know, is even historically, mythologically, if you think, if you read of the, the mythology of the, uh, uh, the Greek or Roman mythology, it's typically a, the duel of heroes, the two heroes were fighting, representing two, you know, cultures, two cities, in, in, in that were represent, instead of doing a war, they were fighting to, to define the fate of the war. Sometimes were like representing like, or also manifesting the two divinities that were protecting and or, or kind of um, devoted for those two different towns in war with each other. So somehow this resembled the kind of the same where those families could challenge each other and the two champions were like facing each other. So those traditions, um, beyond that, you know, the people carrying those arts, um, in, especially in the south of Italy regions, were part of the local culture, right? That, at least in the 17th centuries, 18th centuries, I couldn't go, you know, try to, my research couldn't go uh, back more than that, the 17th centuries, at least documenting it. Oral tradition says it was much older than that. Oral tradition says that those arts belong and go back to really the medieval time to some night orders. I cannot confirm this. This is oral traditions, but, uh, but the names of those arts are indeed, or those uh, traditions, they call themselves Cavalieri di Umiltà, so Knights of Humility. And the reason is that, um, Back then, they were representing so almost like local sheriffs, sort of representing of local laws in the town. So the this the elderly, you know, the, it's called we call the grandmaster of the family or over the society, called also capo bastone, kind of the the, the chief uh, of of the, the stick chief, the the, I don't know, the head of the stick. Uh, I don't know how to translate this very well, but the Capo Bastone was a local figure where people were going asking for advice, asking to mediate potential litigations between people. And if necessary, they were drawing out the knife or the sword or the stick, and they were like fighting to defend the town or the community. Um, and they call themselves the Uomini di Vita, which means the men of life, because they were protecting uh, the, the, the life and they were well devoted to the local culture. They even have some, uh, some sort of a knighthood initiation where traditionally you were sent as a squire 
to learn from your uncle, not your dad, uh, when you're a little kid around the age of seven, until when you were an adult, typically like 21, you were now invested as a knife. And some were even taking a celibate to devote themselves and fight for the society and not as an individual. So some, they, they had their own arts and especially use of this uh, knife and sticks as well as, you know, or as a very sophisticated society and structure. Now what happened in the 1800 when Italy was unified? You know, and Garibaldi came down in Sicily and, you know, came up and Italy was now a republic. And so someone went to, to those people and said, okay, you know, it's, the things changed. Now there is a new order. Uh, you don't respond to no, uh, certain aristocrats anymore. And sometimes these cavaliers di Milta were kind of representing some local aristocracy. Um, or rely on them because they, they couldn't like have armies patrolling the entire land in those actually very sophisticated, very complex, uh, re isolated region with small streets, these old towns, etc. So they were relying on those people, this Wami Divita. Um, but then that changed. And so many of them, because they respected, of course, the, the rules, they said, okay, uh, if that's the case, we step back and we will respect the new order. But others did not. Right? And they decided, they said, well, we don't recognize that. We, we own this land, we protect these people, so we will keep doing it. The problem, they become illegal. And so those societies become secret societies and illegal societies. And even today, you know, the synonym of those who you know, moved into the, uh, let's say the dark side in that sense, um, they are called still today uomini di malavita. And malavita in, it, in, in Italy is a synonym for criminality, such as mafia, camorra, andrangheta, sacra corona, etc. Just a second, please. I have some questions because it's interesting when you, uh, when you speak Italian. It's always amazing to me because, as you might know, I'm, I'm fluent in Spanish. How much I understand Italian when you, when you just because of Spanish, you know? They say, you know, it's so wonderful. They say, oh, okay, I understand that, although I don't know Italian. But before uh, saying that, because I have been um, reading a lot on this uh, Spanish history, and as you know, they have this Navaja. And they, some of them are also very long because swords were, and there are lots of publications by our colleagues in Spain, many you know, academics on the history of Navaja. So basically because swords were not allowed to be carried by many, right? So they had this long Navaja. And was it also the same development in your country? I was just wondering. Um, partially, you know, again, if you look at the variety of knives, there are so many. And again, depends on the purpose, the type of duel or the tradition they belong to. So some are definitely an involution of a sword that is sort of small swords, portable ones that is slowly start to shrink and re but retain somehow the structure. There is a guard, um, th there is a form of like you engage, bind and push, by it, but you know, distance changes and the dynamic is very different. But they definitely, if, kind of derived from that, but others are completely not. I mean, uh, some comes from working knives, from, you know, farming, from shepherds. Uh, these are heavy blades, large, made to be sturdy and cut stuff, working knives. So it turned out that they're, they're really good to, to break bones and cut to flesh. Uh, and so it's different, right? If you have a long, thin, agile weapon, uh, even if it's like a long, like a stiletto, that's good. It still could be deadly, but it's more like thrusting through a target and be very quickly and intercept, as opposed to a larger blade, such as, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, in, in, later on another tradition, such as Cele Meraviglia is another uh, knife, uh, for, but made for really battle self-defense, works in close range combat, is almost wrestling with a knife and is made to slain and cut and go through body. Um, and the weapon derives from working knives. Uh, and, and some are like, without a point, flat, almost like, you know, a, an ax and are made because you want mostly to cut 
the opponent to leave a scar, but not necessarily to, to kill. So they're developed to more to maximize damage without uh, being necessarily too deadly. And uh, some comes from razors. And so, uh, and again, you, when you see the variety of knives, really there is a history behind. Is there a general term in Italian for these type of knives, as we have in Spanish? Is there a general term? No, no, I'd say there are classes. Like you could, you could group some under lo stiletto. Uh, you can group others under, you know, uh, the other tradition, as I mentioned, Cielo Meraviglia use uh, lo stilato. It's called stilato di frosolone. Um, and so on, but there is not, you know, uh, there are dueling knives, you know, uh, coltelli da duello yes. in general, but coltelli, I mean, the, the, the names used are pugnali, coltelli, e daghe. I would say that's overall covers, where coltello tends to be more a working knife, and pugnale tends to be one that has, um, you know, double edge, or is a knife for battle. Uh, and not cut stuff, or you know, and uh, and um, daga is definitely um, it, 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 it's well pugnale is a combat knife. A daga is a, is a battle knife. Is is thought for the battlefield for war. Mm, I mean, it's interesting. The reason I'm asking you is because uh, I'm not going. To, I'm, I was making these comparisons because you know there is a, as a, we talked about it in. Our colleagues made a lots of research on when a navaja is a navaja and when is it a cuchillo, a knife, and when is a daga in Spanish. And then navaja gains its own name for certain type of knife in Spain, which was carried for self-defense even against sword, swordsman. And then later also when Napoleon you know, conquered Spain. So when you come, and that's why, and I'm just trying to make some, because, you know, as much as I know Spanish history, United States, these are these two fields, or Germany, I don't know anything about your country. That's why I'm so interested to make comparisons <laughs> to, ah. to understand, right? That's the reason I'm asking you. I mean, then we can have just a session talking about different knives, history, origins, because of course is, um, is a very rich. And interestingly, there are still um, makers. You know, there are people who still make knives in original ways. Um, in Italy, in different regions, uh, especially in the, the south. But um, so, in, and interesting, it's not sometimes the makers, and that comes a little bit also from the idea of swords, are not the same people who use those, right? The swordsmiths, and I would say maybe the, the, the knife smiths today, they have their own culture and tradition, and sometimes they are, they are not the ones that know how to use those. They know the techniques, the styles, the needs, why, but they work maybe closely with the societies or families or groups, and, but they're typically not something that is within the culture of the use of it. I mean, in my experience, very rare that, you know, if, if a group, a school or a society, they have their own styles of knife, but they don't make them. They generally rely on others that maintain those traditions that they can make those weapons for them. And how many schools, I mean, what kind of question? Do you know how many schools exist in Italy of these uh, martial arts traditionally? Is it possible to say even? I think uh, I, lo I lost count, so I, 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 it's hard, no. I mean, I keep discovering coming up, there are new people, new families, um, I'd say in probably in the tens number of tens, um, and then depends how you want to classify this, right? Because uh, you know when we're talking about only the ones that are alive, and we want to to look and you know divide in even swords who retain certain traditions, so type of swords or type of styles, like in in. Classical fencing, dueling fencing. Now there was a school of the north, of the center, of the south, of the islands. A school of Naples, of uh, Roman, the Bologna the school, the school of Milan. Um, you know, things evolved, and there is complexity. What survived today of that? So we need to have a layer of you know a timeline and the historical dimension versus what is currently alive. Academic, military. 
regional layers. That's another layer to do um, there. Um, so I, I can't say for sure. Like I say, only if you look at knife fencing in Sicily or in Apulia, there, there are, I don't know, tens of masters of different families. So I know I, I lost count. <laughs> okay. Another question I have, and when you when I started to ask questions, I know I'm going, because you mentioned it, I'm going to ask you because I'm very, <laughs> very interested in the topic, but I will let you know why. You mentioned the topic of Nedrangheta and also secret societies. Do you think that they were in the past or maybe now associated with some of these practices or is it just, is it an educated guess you said, or you know what I mean? Yeah, no, um, I'm telling you what is uh, openly disclosed. Uh, they are absolutely connected. You know, the reason is they, and that's the reason also why they have been secret for a long time, maybe until more recently, because they, those people were challenging each other. Again, sometimes it's more to what is called regolari conti, uh, so to kind of, solve an issue um, of peace of honor. And uh, as I said, the champions were challenging dueling with a knife. And it doesn't have to be at last blood. It could be sometimes. And even the way you might be killed was sending a signal that was a meaning to the other party. Um, and saying, what was your scar? So what was the mistake that you made um and i'd say just you know I, we are going to details but if someone was stealing something for someone uh, to the wrong family and someone else then maybe not even a duel maybe that guy was taken in an ambush maybe killed cut their hands and put on on the neck and, and the body sent back to the family to send a signal this guy stole and this is what happens. But, uh, but even in the duel, sometimes being cut in the face, that was, could conclude the duel, but that means you lost and you have a mark. So you lost part of your honor because you have been touched. And again, maybe different blades are used for different contexts because, yeah. um, but so to, to long story is yes, those arts were preserved in those secret societies and were part of their use. There was a, somewhat also some spiritual meaning behind um, many of those traditions. And again, both the, let's say, not, it's a secret societies, but also the more private societies of so families that were not in the community, they're not, I mean, they're still today, you know, we know some of them, they're open, and they're not, they have nothing to do with the criminalities, but they retain those traditions. They belong to this woman di vita and not to the woman di mala vita. And, uh, and we know who they are, they, they're open. They're devoted to certain archangels, to certain saints, 